Hey, it's Will. I've got a first of many videos on writing plugins with Rack AFX 7. In particular, writing plugin projects. It's important that you understand that you create a project in Rack AFX that you turn into a plugin that you uh, debug and you analyze and you listen to and you work on. Then you can turn that into an AU or an AX or VST plugin. In Rack AFX 7, I created a whole new API called RAFX2 or RAFX2. The very first thing you have to decide is, do you want to write a native RAFX2 plugin or do you want to write a RAFX plugin with an ASPIC core? All RAFX2 plugins are DLLs that have the suffix RAFX2. If you are interested in using RAFX2 for embedded DSP or an embedded audio signal processing system, where you need a lean API that doesn't rely on any other API or any GUI libraries or anything else, just pure audio, then this is a really good way to go. If you have written a VST2 plugin in 1997 and you remember encoding and decoding all your parameters and setting up all your GUI controls and all that stuff, that's what you have to do here. If you need to do that and you are interested, contact me and I can certainly help you, especially if you're looking to do embedded DSP stuff. We can, we can set that up and make something like that happen, but you need to contact me on how to make that work. For uh, a plugin with an ASPIC core, the ASPIC chunk is inside of it, and I've got a video that I just explain how all that works. And when you do an export for AX, AU, or VST, it just rips the core out of RAFX, and this core now contains nothing having to do with RAFX2 at all. You can then take that and turn that into AX, AU, or VST. That's all in other videos, and we're going to work on that later. But we're going to use an ASPIC core in our plugin. That means we're going to be writing our core signal processing code in a couple of files in here. It's actually really, really easy. I'm going to show you how to do that. We're going to debug within that. And then it's up to you if you want to export and take it to the next level. And of course, there's videos on how to do that as well. So we're going to assume we're using an ASPIC plugin core. ASPIC relies on VST GUI 4 to do its GUI rendering. I do not um, try to hack or compile or, or contain that library. You simply use it and you put the folder inside of your projects folder. So the way that that works is open projects folder here takes you to your Rack AFX projects folder. And once you have the projects folder opened up, that's where all your projects are going to lie. And you're going to need to put the latest VST GUI 4 folder in there. It's VST GUI 4.8 at the time of this video. The good news is Rack AFX will do it for you. There's a utility menu here that says install VST GUI 4.8. All that does is a brute force copy of all those files. It does not do anything programmatically or alter anything. It just makes a big copy of that. So make sure you've got the VST GUI 4 installed and we'll be ready to go. Let's start a new project right now with the new button. The project name is going to be Hello Volume. It's going to be a volume control plugin. That's kind of the first plugin everyone always writes. This, instead of Hello World, it's Hello Volume. For the automatic parameter smoothing, I want to check that, and I'm going to set 20 milliseconds for parameter smoothing. We'll talk about that in just a minute. I'm going to choose the Rack AFX custom GUI, and I'm going to put uh, four bogus, uh, two four-character codes in here that are bogus. If you're going to be selling your plugin and exporting it as ASPIC, then you need to worry about that. If you're not doing that, you don't have to worry. So I'm going to leave that alone. I've got Visual Studio 2015 set up as my default compiler. It's going to open a Visual Studio 2015 session, create a project for me, and then we'll see how the project is laid out in Rack AFX 7. If you've used Rack AFX 6, you remember that we use a flat directory structure there and you have just a giant solution full of components and full of files. In Rack AFX 7, it is highly, highly compartmentalized. And this is not only the project, but the, uh, the not only the project in Visual Studio, but the actual project, the folder hierarchy of it. So you can see I've got some items here. There's VST GUI 4 and some resources. The plugin kernel here contains the core in the GUI. This is the ASPIC core. This is what will get exported. This is where we're going to be doing our work. You can poke around in these other uh, files later on, and we'll talk about those as well. Inside of the core, there is a plugin core.h file and a plugin core.cpp file. 
99.9% of all your work is going to be in these two files. So it's really actually simple. Even though there's a lot of stuff to look at in here, you really only need to look at these two files. So we'll start with the core.h file. Here's where a class declaration is for the, our, uh, our derived class to do our plugin. All of this is explained in my C++ books. Uh, so go ahead and get that. I'm not going to rail on that here. There's a little pair of hex codes up here where RackAFX is going to write some stuff. There's a, a section down here that I've already written out. This is where you want to put your user variables and functions. There's a private area here that RackAFX will use. In the plugin core.cpp file, there's only three functions that you're ever going to look at and probably only two of them that you're ever going to use. There's an init plugin parameters function here, which is where you declare and expose your GUI to the host. RackAFX is going to write the code that's going to sit inside of here. After that is a reset function. Any components in your plugin that are sample rate dependent will need to be set up in here. This function gets called anytime the sample rate changes. Finally, there is a process audio frame function here. This is where your signal processing is going to happen. So we'll pop back in these and, and talk about these in a minute. Let's go back to the interface here and get us a volume knob. This is going to be a glorified volume plugin. It's going to have a knob. It's going to have a mute button. It's going to have VU meters on it and a fancy channel switcher. It's going to demonstrate all the different things you need in the easiest way possible. I'm going to right click on this first control. You can pick any of them that you want, but I'm going to use the first one. And I'm going to choose knob from that list. You can put radio buttons, two state switches, option menus, which means a drop down list of strings for the user to choose from or VU meters will go over all these and other videos. Today we're going to be working with the knob. Now, the way that I have this set up, you don't have to click or do anything. You can see that control name is highlighted. All you have to do is start typing and hit return. The name of this control is volume. I'm going to type that, hit return, go to the next field, which is units. There are no units. I'm going to hit the backspace key and then hit return. The data type is going to be a double. There's an, a menu list to choose from, but I can get double with the D button, the D key on my keyboard, sorry. The variable name is volume. That's what I'm going to bind this control to. The low limit is zero. The high limit is one. The default value is 0 0.707, which is minus three dB. You can do all this very quickly. Once you know how to do this a couple of times, you can prototype a massive GUI in a matter of just a few minutes. You can turn the TV on, watch your favorite TV show, get the whole GUI prototype without even having to think too much about it. For the knob graphics, I'm going to use an Ableton Blue knob. Uh, let's see here, Ableton Blue 2. There's a bunch of different knobs for you to choose from for the graphics on that. So I'm going to hit OK. And it's going to write the code for me and set up my Ableton Blue knob. I'm going to open the compiler here to take a look at the .h file. Here is the variable it just wrote for me, double volume zero. So RackAFX wrote and initialized that variable. And over in plugin core, it wrote a little chunk of C++ code right here. That is the code which exposes this plugin parameter. My volume control that is a double, that has a smoothing time of 20 milliseconds that has low limit, high limit, and default values here. So you can recognize this chunk of code from what you just typed in in RackAFX. I'm going to go to the process audio frame function here. You can see that there is one argument. It is a constant reference, uh, sorry, a reference to a structure, which is called a process frame info structure. And this contains all of the input and output stuff from this function. Inside of the function, I'm going to I'm going to cut away this piece of code, which is going to debug a synth plugin. I know it's not a synth plugin, so I'm going to remove that. You can see three chunks of code, mono in, mono out, mono in, stereo out, stereo in, stereo out. This is where you write that code. Aspic supports dozens of multi-channel formats that you can then use in Ambisonics, in AU, VST, and AX plugins. Rack AFX7, to keep things simple, still just supports these three common um, formats. If you want to do ambisonics, have at it. Create a plugin here, do your stereo debugging, and then export that out to uh, AAX. Then you can debug it for in AAX and do ambisonics from that point on. For this plugin, I'm going to be very verbose. I know I've got a um, mute switch coming, so I'm going to create a 
I'm going to create a temporary or an intermediate variable, or actually a final variable, final volume, and I'm going to initialize that to the, the current volume control variable here. And that means that this final volume variable is going to have in it some value between 0 and 1, which, uh, which the user has adjusted on the GUI. I'm going to take that and I'm going to multiply that by the, the input sample. So the input samples are here in audio input frame. The output samples are here in audio output frame. By the way, since this is the core of ASPIC, you can go to the ASPIC documentation, which is live on the internet, and you can, you can find all this information. So all these things we're talking about right now, every single bit of it is right inside of here. So you can go, um, you, you can go check out everything. It is the entire SDK documentation. So you, as a Rack AFX7 developer, are only going to need a little teeny piece of this involving processing the audio data. You can safely kind of not worry about the rest of that. So let me go back and let me take my audio processing and I'm going to add that code to each of these three chunks. This is going to give me my processing, and I'm going to go ahead and rebuild the project right now. I'm going to do that from Rack AFX with the Rebuild button. Now, this is the very first time it builds. The first rebuild is going to be the slowest rebuild. That's pretty much true for, for any Visual Studio project, but the very first time it has to go through and do uh, a build from scratch. When you do a rebuild in Visual Studio, that does what's called a clean first and then a rebuild. So this very first one is going to be slow. You're going to watch um, all of the components get compiled into place. You're also going to see VST GUI 4 code get compiled. This is the little stub of code you need. <laughs> Literally, these two files are the entire VST GUI 4 package for Rack AFX. That's all that you need in the plot in the project. So it's very very simple, but you may wind up watching a bunch of errors coming. There's one right there. Uh, sorry, a warning coming from the VST GUI library. The VST GUI 4 library is always kind of on top of things as far as C++ goes. The engineers there will deprecate functions and then give you a few revs to get them fixed up and then they'll pull them out for good. The good news for us is all of these deprecations that you're seeing that's VST GUI engineers' problems. They deprecate them for themselves. They let that go for a couple of revs, and then they pull them out. So don't get overly concerned if you see a lot of warnings coming from VST GUI. It's all good. We can see the project succeeded. The plugin is right here, hellovolume.rafx2. I'm going to load that into RackAFX. And I'm going to play some audio through it. Now, this is a linear volume control, so it's going to work, but it's not going to be perfect. Now, the good news is it's not glitchy or clicky, and that's because of the parameter smoothing. So it is a smooth control, but if you watched it, there was hardly any change in the audio for about almost the entire top half of the control. That is because we have a linear control and our ears hear logarithmically. One option would be to convert this control to dB. That is what I do in the FX book. So whenever I do this for FX plugins, I'm always going to have volume in dB. Just for this one video and this one example, I'm going to show you an alternative. If we were doing this in analog, and this was an analog uh, knob, which is called a potentiometer or a pot, you would buy what's called a log taper pot or an audio taper pot to do that. That's because our, our ears hear logarithmically. One little caveat there is that it really is not a log taper pot. It's actually an anti-log taper pot. I don't know why they call it log taper. I guess it just, it's easier to sell it that way. It's even more confusing if it's called anti-log, but really it is, I promise. So to make this mimic an analog pot, we'll change it to anti-log and hit OK. Now we've only changed one flag inside of one parameter in here, so I'm just going to do a build right from Visual Studio. I don't want to go through an entire clean and rebuild just to incorporate that one minor you know, change that we made inside of there. So that's what's going on. I'm going to let that, this shouldn't take very long, I'll let that go ahead and build. And then when that happens, I'll pull up. See, we're almost done here. I'll go ahead and pull up Rack AFX. Now, when we load it in this time, and I'll do one check here. Yep, we succeeded. 
I'll load the plugin and play it now. And now we have a potentiometer or a knob, which is behaving like an analog log taper pot, which is really an anti-log taper pot. All right, I'm going to stop the video here, and I'm going to add more controls in the next video. In the next video, I'm not going to talk about VST GUI or any of the setup stuff. We're just going to go right in and begin adding more controls. So I'll see you in that video.